I can say I'm not Jacqueline. I'm a single mother. I have a boyfriend, so no money. Some two weeks to come. I'm the president of the Emerald Movement Center. I'm Mutangamundu Destin. I'm 20 years old. I'm a member of the Emerald Movement Center. My name is Honorine Eme. I study in Group Scholar Officer of Utari. My name is Zime, the thing is Zemel. I'm 35 years old. <laughs> My name is Jacqueline Wamgiza. I work at uh, Societe de Mirkodin. My name is Mdaise Katerin. I am a member of the Omnyamirambo Men Center. My name is Aminata. I have two children. I'm Wavita Sifa. I live at Kasiata. I have three children. My name is Uhaum Shesperance. I'm a member of Nyamirambo Women's Center. I have two children. I'm married. My name is Maria Mekujin. Now I'm the president of Nyamirambo Women's Center. I'm Maya Ladic. I'm 26 years old. I'm single. I work at the Peace Institute. I'm Lasta Jalusic. I'm 52 years old, have a daughter, and I'm the author of this documentary. I never thought I would get involved into a development project enterprise. Yet on my research visit to Rwanda in 2007, while I was working on a research about collective violence in Rwanda, I met Vestine, Jacqueline and Jacqueline's small daughter Lina. Short after that, I started with providing financial help for school fees and living costs for Jackie and little Lina, while my fellow researcher Yasminka did the same for Vestine. And then, somehow we got sucked into the endeavor of helping to establish a self-help women's group in Yamirambo, Kigali. Rwanda is a country of extreme contrasts. Its breathtaking nature, beautiful landscape and traditional handicraft nowadays attracts many tourists and travelers. While its dreadfully violent episode of recent history still occupies researchers and human rights activists. Best economic growth and entrepreneurship, notwithstanding there are still enduring phenomena of poverty and illiteracy, especially among women, as well as maternal and child mortality. And in spite of poverty reduction strategies, huge differences remain. A minor strata of Rwandans lead an affluent lifestyle, drive expensive cars and are attended by house servants, while many more of the country's 10 million inhabitants still work for their basic supplies only. Some even now survive only in servitude to others, many young girls and boys among them. No, she was not paying me additional, I was working for her, she was giving us food and place to sleep, that was all, that's what I had asked her. I didn't want any money additional because I thought if I ask for money, she will not accept me to sleep with her. She will pay me some money and then she will tell me to rent a space for myself, which could be difficult for me alone.
Rwanda bears unhealed wounds and scars of the worst genocide since the Holocaust. The country's villages and towns are teeming with memorials, bearing witness to the events of 1994, when from approximately 800,000 to 1 million Tutsis and moderate Hutus were slaughtered in just a few months. In a coordinated action of the army and the militias, large parts of the population were mobilized and participated in the mass killings, so that neighbors killed their neighbors. Rwandans, when asked, give you an exact answer about the roots of genocide. Colonial divisionism and racism, which produced a powerful picture of the population of two alleged African races, Abatutsi and Abahutu, and used the Tutsi minority for their imperialist domination. A deep-rooted system of social and economic injustice was perpetuated by a corrupt post-colonial government. People were incited to chase away, rob and kill the other, a Mututsi, who was identified as a non-human being with allegedly recognizable race features. Because now you can talk to the criminals themselves, they tell you, you ask them, where did you get that power of evil to come to, to the level of killing even your, you know, even some people who did genocide, some of them were even stupid. Because you would have, let's say, for example, I'm a Tutsi and I'm a husband and you are my wife and then we have five children. So because in our beliefs, in our traditional beliefs, we have a tribe, we say now, if a child must be, take the tribe of his father. So if I'm a Tutsi and you are Hutu but you are my wife, so the children are Tutsi, now you kill your own children. This is stupidity, that's, I don't know how I can define that. And you have the cases like that. Just imagine to kill your own children. You kill your husband, or you kill your wife. And this is, you know, these people have been fooled and confused completely. The present-day Rwandan authorities, under the resolute leadership of Rwandan patriotic frontman Paul Kagame, are implementing a persistent policy of persecution of the main perpetrators of genocide. On the other hand, they promote a controlled, strict and sometimes imposed reconciliation. When in 2003 the first bigger group of genocide perpetrators was released from prison, the survivors would ask them questions, like Stephen posed to the killer of his parents. I, tell me, tell me why. And the man told me that ever since I was young, I grew up as an orphan. My, my parents died when I was young, I didn't even know them. But my grandmother used to tell me from day to day that they were killed by Tutsis. I have to hate Tutsis for the rest of my life. So having officially, I mean, announced the genocide, for me it was a chance now to, to kill openly and freely. And I was convinced, really, I accepted that because he told me the truth. Even though it was maybe very hard to, to face that reality and accept, but slow by slow I, I come to understand that. But hate was neither the only nor the main motive to kill. Many people killed because of the government pressure, greed, or other reasons. There is another category of people who also killed maybe for financial reasons. Because you could kill me and you root all my properties and you take them. Others have killed because of trying to rape. When you resist, then they kill you. Some measures to prevent the return of violence are rousing divided observers' reactions. Like the revival of the traditional gachacha courts, where the accused are confronted with the whole community and the recently adopted law against genocide ideology, prohibiting the use of any ethnic labels whatsoever in public and severely punishing any transgressions, regardless of age. You know, here in the country there is a law which, which really doesn't allow the, any kind of genocide ideology. So that's why people fear openly to talk about the identities and this ethnicity. They fear to talk about them because they know how dangerous things. 
But Stephen is convinced that the problem of ethnic ideology is above all the problem of old people who experienced the old divisionist policies and genocide. I can even take a quick example to my grandmother. You can't, you cannot tell her how Mhutu can be someone good. And she's even reasonable, I can't condemn her, because she had six daughters and two boys. All of them died, and the husband, my grandpa, died. In one way or another, the once ethnically totally divided population nowadays cultivates patriotic emotions, living side by side, and Rwandans seem to be proud of their country's relative safety, prosperity and tidiness. So now we, are, we have set new values of Rwandan society. So we are reviving those ones who were there and adding other news according to the technology and the development where we are now. Not to kill, for example, killing goes a taboo being honest and, and faithful. They, they are not, now they are. Now they are adding on other new, like customer care, like working on time, like uh, fighting against the drugs and the, and the, and the plagues, like HIV and what, things like that. Signs of rapid economic reforms and growth, improvement in infrastructure, especially in some parts of the capital Kigali in terms of housing, health and particularly schooling, are striking to the returning visitor. You come from another planet, let's say, maybe you are like an alien, you just come and you fall in Kigali. Without reading any history about Rwanda or hearing what happened to you, you just see physically how many Rwanda are very happy clean, you know, friendly, it's just, you can't imagine that there is something like this that happened. By many young people, among them women and well-educated returnees, whose families experienced long years of emigration, the post-genocide Rwanda is seen as a new beginning. Is everybody comfortable in English? Yes? yes. Okay. Rwanda seems to be a country of opportunities because it's still, it's young again. So, so it's a good feeling because you're there, you're, anything you do has impact, you see results. You, mm -hmm. So I think it's, now is a better time than maybe the future, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Because with time, there'll be more competition. There'll yeah. be more people. There's a lot of hope, a lot of goodwill, a lot of you know, mm -hmm. eagerness to change things, to do things. So it's really at a time when anything you do Mm -hmm. is, is really, you know, bringing results. Okay. Although men were the most frequent victims of 1994 genocide, many women and children were killed and suffered enormously. Collective mass rapes turned out to be the one of the most critical and internationally discussed features of the genocide. This is why women are seen as those who suffered in particular. The terrible way of terrorizing the local population with mass rape, which still continues on the Democratic Republic of the Congo side of the Rwandan border, can only persist in the situation of impunity. While rape in war has finally been declared a crime against humanity by the international law, Rwanda's new authorities seem to have understood the important role of gender crisis as a basis for collective violence. The post-genocidal political orientation is intensely concerned with the reduction of gender-based violence. 
Women, their integration into wider social life and empowerment became one of the foci of Rwandan public policies after 1994. An enormous leap in terms of gender equality legislation and an incredible move in recruiting women for institutional politics has been made. Rwanda is the country with the highest percent of women in parliament in the world and the increase in the number of women in primary and secondary education and in the employed workforce in the last years has been exceptional. It is believed that educated and prosperous women can substantially contribute to peace, reconciliation and development of the country and even more can be some kind of a vehicle of development. The Rwandan genocide proved that women can equally participate in collective evil doings as well, as was the case with the former Minister of Women and Family, Pauline Nimarasuhuko, who's been recently sentenced by the Arusha Criminal Court. The assumption that women are naturally more peaceful than men still directs these policies. Nonetheless, the traditional gender roles in Rwanda loom large. I think the, the bad thing is like, I don't know if you, there is something like masculinity, positive masculinity. Yes. This sense of being a man, I am a man just in a sense of, of I mean, of, not in the power and something like that, but that being a man. If you are in the barrack here, the dominant, the predominant theme of the men will be how much they Maybe they beat their wives. How they try to show this masculinity just as a man. If you, t you bring 10,000 here in the bar, and you buy all the people who are there, say, come on, take, 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 and you go home with nothing, they will call you a man. Oh, African men, don't you know? With a fist you love, don't show. Take my hand, let's leave this valley. Use your strength. Euh, leur capacité, leur droit, à cause de la culture. S'ils peuvent faire ceci, s'ils ont le même droit que les hommes, à cause de la culture, que les femmes n'avaient aucun droit dans le temps, et qu'ils disent que toute chose appartient à l'homme, il, il existe certaines femmes et qui gardent ça comme coutume et qui perdent leur droit à cause de la culture. Mais il y en a qui sont évolués à cause du gender, qui reçoivent euh, leur droit et qui usent leur droit. A man can behave in any way he wants, as long as her wife doesn't know anything about a good behavior of her husband. It, like, let, let me say philosophically. <laughs> the tree can never fear to die because it doesn't know that it is mortal. Okay? Yeah. So then, now, for us, we fear to die because we know that we are mortal, right? That's correct. So now, if a wife doesn't know anything about violence, then she will be violated, and she will never know this. To that side, I was talking about bad, I mean, negative masculinity, but now positive. It's just, it's all responsibility, I think. Family, family, marriage and family, I'm not married anyway. <laughs> Family, I think it's all about love and, and, and the responsibility and, some, and the respect and all of that. So if you respect your wife, you love her, there are responsibilities as a man you have to carry out and you do it. So then you will be a good husband. A woman still bears sole responsibility for the upbringing of children, while abortion remains criminalized. Women who carry it out can be condemned to long jail sentences. When I got pregnant, after I met, I lost my job. I had nowhere to go. Then I was walking around. I had some little money because I was saving for school. 
and I was not ready to abort because I thought if I do it, I would die. So I started my life alone. I went to Nyamirambo. I couldn't get a cheap house as I was expecting from my friend's formation. Then I came across an old lady who Avestina was saying, and then she helped me. I stayed with them. While making a decision to work with the women we got to know in the Nyamirambo community in Kigali, we wanted to take up these issues as individual and wider social problems, which arise both from gender inequality and inability of women to end the poverty trap. We undertook steps that were articulated by the group of women themselves. In March 2008, an independent Rwandan non-governmental organization was established. Nyamirambo Women's Center started with, I am the one who formed Nyamirambo Women's Center and I formed it with an idea from two researchers who came from Slovenia, that was Rasta and Yasmika. When they came, they came, they had some work they are doing in Chigali, so I went with Vestin because she couldn't speak English. When you called me, actually, I was thinking, how is it going to be? But I said, I will try and see because I also myself needed somebody to be with. And you, it, when you mentioned about making a group of ladies, I found it wonderful because I said, now I'll, if I tell them that we're going to be together and some people will be helping us to solve some little problems in our daily life, then it could help. Otherwise, we didn't even think of income, any income generating activity. The Rambo Women Center is a group of women. Single mothers, okay, we are mixed. They are, who, they are there, those women who have children and there are young girls who are there. So we started when we were 18, numbers, and they started, I think, two years ago. That is 2008. We normally attend meetings twice a month, mid of the month, then end of the month. We normally talk about the Women's Center. What can we do so that it continues? What there are many things. How can we survive? How, what can we do so that our life continues? Our work is to teach English the local community, but the only women, and to teach English our members and to pay school fees for the some women who study in university and to help us to pay school fees for children. The woman who lives in Nyamirambo had think about what they can do together in order to, to feel that they are in a family. During night four, I've lost my family, my husband, my husband of four, and ish, that, that even has affecting me. Normally I don't uh, speak to everybody, but with, uh, with Nyamrambo Women Center members, they are They are make me strong, if I can say that. Yeah. And the uh, Nyamirambo Women's Center, I have uh, got sponsors for my school. The gens qui ne sont pas dans les environs, hmm, qui attendent Nyamirambo Women's Center, qui voient des dépliants, qui parlent de Nyamirambo Women's Center, se demandent succès. Hmm? 
ils se disent pourquoi ils ont choisi Nyamirambo au Men Center pourquoi les femmes seulement hmm? Et il y a une, de la discrimination là-bas et je lui ai expliqué que juste pour la formation de l'association de Nyamirambo Men Center c'était au départ les femmes qui vivaient toutes seules, les femmes, les filles qui vivaient toutes seules, qui avaient des problèmes comme ça. Et c'est comme ça que la société, l'association est née. Rwandan non-governmental organizations are expected to participate in the implementation of governmental programs and at the government's events, happenings, campaigns, and to stand firmly behind the idea of Rwandan patriotism. Sun's bright and the wind's in my hair And I'm quietly dreaming about you Apart from their planned activities and meetings, women from the center thus regularly took part at the governmental celebrations and commemorations. They also diligently worked on the days of Umuganda, a traditional voluntary, yet in practice obligatory community labor, which they perform each last Saturday of the month. We are going to do community work. Today is the day of general cleaning. Everybody is a day off and they are supposed to clean the surrounding. As the center was becoming a site of activities, its president soon became one of the local leaders. I'm called the vice president of Njana, it's like the advisors of the cell, and I'm the vice president of it. And they chose me because of actually all came from the center. Because when the center was established in Ibiriogo, so many things changed. The Muslim ladies in Ibiriogo used not to go to school. They didn't know how to read and write. And they were getting funds and loans from the banks and they were losing the money because they did not know how to read and write. Located in the vibrant multicultural community of Nyamirambo, with a sizable Rwanda Muslim population, the center created a space for new possibilities, not only for its members, but also for the local population, women, children and also men. Women from the local community were eager to join the offered activities, educational programs and trainings, literacy course, English course and handicraft course. Meanwhile, Dnyamirambo Women's Center members themselves started to offer workshops on gender-based violence and worked especially with local leaders. The funds that we received from the European Commission and from the government of Slovenia were used for the organization of courses, payments for the teachers and for the salaries of the local project leaders. Days of the week, from Monday up to Sunday. Who can write for us our Sunday? My mother. Who can write for us Tuesday? Yet we had higher ambitions, to buy a land and build a house for the center, where women could receive visitors coming to Rwanda for various reasons, and run a restaurant, to make the group financially self-sufficient in the long run. Nyamirambo one of the oldest parts of the city, where Swahili traders settled down to establish a trade post, is also known as a place where the lives of many Tutsis were saved. The local Muslims protected them in the genocide. This part of the city of Kigali, with its colorful small shops, markets and several mosques, is by many people seen as a historic and cosmopolitan quarter. But it is also poverty-stricken, crowded with people, many of them migrants. 
Located opposite the Biryogo market, the center offers an interesting point of departure for any interested visitors. Although Rwandan authorities focus on the high-end tourism above all, we saw the chance for the women's center in offering something else. Responsible community-based tourism seemed to be a realistic income and a learning opportunity for the center's members. Together with the tour operator, New Dawn Associates, we set up a tour for the visitors, which was offered online by the New Dawn. They and some other experts trained the members as a local tour guides and hosts. The center and the local community were supposed to get 70% share of the profits. If you all want to become involved in tourism, then it should not only be something where you see, OK, we can make some income. In my view, very often it is much more important that you have the chance to learn a lot about the world, to make new friends, to learn about other cultures, to just open your own mind. happens in tourism and the idea is for the people to understand those relationships of exploitation and if you understand how they happen you can work to prevent them and you can say we're not going to have that form of tourism we're going to have a good form of tourism no this is just a question loudly thinking among all these things we've ma mentioned here what do you have and what don't you have and what do you think you can add on to what you already have? Still like the moisture in the air. Soon women started receiving visitors, offering them special experience. They were given a crash course of Kenya Rwanda. What is your name? My name is Then guided through the local neighborhood. They're interested in knowing how are we people we are surviving. They're interested, mostly they're interested in the one part of tour where we take them in the market. Mm -hmm. They're interested in seeing the vegetables around, the fresh fruits. They are very much interested in it. There are very many things they don't know and they are seeing them. Shown around the local market, shops and businesses, And a hairdresser's salon. Still like the moisture in the air, and I'm quietly thinking about you. Sun's bright in the winds in my hair. Finally, they were giving a cookery lesson in local food preparation, and afterwards, a lovely dinner. The tour soon became known in the tourist guides, and travelers' internet sites praised the women's work. Still like the moisture in the While we worked together and the project grew, there were many joyous moments. but also disappointments and failures, as well as disputes over goals and purposes of the center. Anyway, they can't allow us to do it. 
this is a thing I inquired and asked. They said we have to have all the papers that we are written somewhere and we should present them to the church. That's why I wanted you to meet them and talk to them. I'm telling them that they shouldn't talk that the, those who are benefiting from the association are those who are going to school only. If they have a problem, they should ask. While trying to escape what we saw as a neo-colonial logic of development projects, we were not always successful. As in many development projects, the attempt to make the center really independent and sustainable was one of the greatest challenges. Crafts is not unsuccessful. It's just that in today's world, when you try to do what everybody's talking about, and that means be sustainable, you need to make money. So if after five years of trying one field you don't make money, uh, you can very well conclude that there is simply no economic potential that would interest you as an organization. The purchase of an appropriate plot of land as a location for the new house for the center was the biggest test for everybody. This was a proposed land for the project but they refused to give it to us because they had plans of demolishing the whole, system, the whole community. We faced two problems, space and time. The space problem was connected with the legacy of land rights in Rwanda, consecutively changed ownership in the past and unsettled documents, and with the recent introduction of Kigali's master urban plan, which has got precise provisions what can be built where and what will be demolished, while anything was extremely difficult to locate on the ground. After the centre had finally found an appropriate plot, the contract was signed and the sum paid, it turned out that the land title transfer would be difficult. The papers were not settled properly. The transfer to the name of Nyamirambo Women's Centre would have to be achieved with the help of a lawyer and through court. This required much more time and energy than anyone expected. Time issues connected with the logic of development projects hinder programs in general. They require a lot of bureaucracy. The funds given must be spent in time, that is, by the contracted end of the project. In given circumstances, this usually means much too quickly. The time specified in the contract might not necessarily correspond to the course of time needed in real life for the completion of work on such a project. Though a wonderful plan for the house had been drawn, it turned out that there wouldn't be enough time to get the building permission to implement it while the funds were still available. The money would have to go back. This was hard, very hard to accept for everyone. So we say to her, look, end of the project, the money must be spent, we must buy a car, we must get the permission for, for land, Jim must work well, everything must, you, we need all the receipts. So every time Maya sends email to Jackie and to Jim because things are not done well, and then she pushes, and she is under big pressure. Although, at first glance, one could assume that the leading members pursued an image of an emancipated woman, there were many clear signs that traditional images of femininity and masculinity held sway over most of their actions and their behavior. Stereotypes came into play when we were choosing the first project manager. The majority of women insisted on employing a man. Jim was thus managing the office for two years, while Jackie led the group as the first elected president of the association. She was both informal and formal leader of the group. I pray 
a big role in counseling them, in giving them examples, taking myself as an example. So, and telling them to be confident. Once a problem comes, you have to be strong and get away of overcoming that problem, not to stay in that problem until you die. Whilst being a single mother of an incredibly gifted daughter, Lina, she began studying management at the Kigali School of Finance and Banking, with a financial support from sponsors in Slovenia. After visiting Europe in early summer 2009, a study visit to Slovenia that she took part in together with another center's member, Jacqueline, and two members of our partner organization, Rwandan Association of University Women, she was seen as an experienced and successful female leader who used to work with the local leaders. She was skillful in dealing with foreign visitors, called Abazungu by Rwandans. She had good command of communicating her own, the women's and the center's message to them and to engage them in support of the center. So that's all I had. Thank you very much. Yet, in the course of time, a latent discontent started growing within the group and Jackie's authority was challenged. The members were reproaching her for not sharing her responsibilities with them, for concealing information and for too closely combining her private matters with the life of the center. This culminated when she decided to marry. She started collecting money and preparing arrangements for her wedding, while the whole center was being mobilized for the event. Now the then I can remember till now. Me, myself, being married is something special to me. Because normally in African culture, once you get a baby without a husband, officially known, it's difficult to get a boyfriend and to get married. So even at the beginning, when I was establishing a center, I was thinking all my life I'm going to live alone. Because I was, I was thinking it's difficult for somebody to come to me and then propose me to stay with him. So, to my side, it's a chance I got to get a man who accepts me and my baby. Traditionally, the marriage in Rwanda has an immense importance for women. Because I love children and you can't, you can't have, I, I, I don't like to have children without their father. Because I need the children and I need a husband. Little love. Uh, I was married and I was always a student. Je venais de faire une année à l'université et mon mari aussi terminait son baccalauréat. On était presque des étudiants tous les deux. Bon, euh, dans le temps, ce n'était pas beaucoup plus compliqué qu'aujourd'hui, parce qu'aujourd'hui, les mariages coûtent cher. Euh, normalement, euh, les familles s'unissent du côté de la femme et du côté de l'homme, du mari. Et chez mon mari, il n'avait que sa maman parce que son, mari, son, son papa était mort quand il était en cinquième année secondaire. Oh, wedding is very good because if you, feel, you do a wedding, every people, even if you, are stay, you stay with your sister, for that day on the wedding day, they, they want to see you again. Mm. So for me, I, I see a wedding is very good things in our life. Huge weddings are the rule, while traditional gender roles and family relations still play a special role in the wedding ritual itself. A woman has to collect gifts and money for the introduction ceremony. We 
what I'll do the first time, they do like a party in my mother's home in Tungami, Uganda. Then that party is for introduction. That means you introduce your boyfriend you're going to marry to the community. There are thus several kinds of pressures on both women and men concerning their married or single state. For me, the marriage now, it's like I'll get respect from the society. That's the first important thing. People in the society will not see me as a prostitute or see me as a person who is irresponsible. I'll be no more in the family, I'll be no more in the society because they all know that I was officially married. Yet many women in Rwanda are single and think they can live alone, and that men are not very responsible. I have come to know that it is possible. You can live without a man. You can live and keep your kids. Yeah. Kanyene na bjo hari biwa muri chijihe urebje ha go abanuenchi buba tsa meze nezari ko. Hakundi mo na gomba gushaka kujirangwa jiru muriango yuba kumuriango na yungu kumuriango. Hariku yule bje hanza hobo ningo ni nchizo muri chiji. After the wedding, Jackie stayed in Uganda with her new husband. Her mandate as a president ran out even before that, yet the other members weren't informed of the fact. Jim's contract expired as well, and there was no supplementary money for the employment of a full-time manager left. The thesis that a man could do a better job at managing projects was not confirmed. All this and the problems with the land title provoked a crisis among the center members. Apart from Jackie, several other members of the center started or continued their interrupted education at the university, with the support of individual sponsors from Slovenia. Vestin, Jacqueline, marie Aime, Aline and Jennifer. And they mostly did well in school. Younger members of the center also showed high ambitions. Uh, I want to, to study medicine. Jacqueline Uvanvisa, Dudu's mother, was the first to finish her studies. She was one of those who experienced violence and loss of her family members in the violent Rwandan events of the 1990s. J'ai tout perdu. Comme on avait tué mon mari, j'avais perdu la tête. J'étais tout enfant. Je me suis mariée. C'était à peine que j'allais avoir 21 ans. As a senior member of the center, she continued with her education and was among numerous Rwandan students who massively graduated in business and administration. Mariemi Umudreni, one of the new graduates of the center, was elected as the new president and took on the leadership of the group. Uh, now I'm the president of Nyamirambo Women's Center. I work from the center. It's uh, fine, but with many challenges. It's too difficult because I'm the second president and the first one she go like a few new members joined the center as well some of our members they don't <clears throat> understand how they can encourage other women to come 
and in Yamirambo Women's Center and be members because they say, let's resolve our problem towards the problem about the land. <laughs> and when we are stable, we can open the door and encourage other women to come. Maya put enormous efforts in acquiring new funds and supervising the whole process. We all had to go through a difficult period of trying circumstances and turmoil, while trying to settle the land title in the centre's name and searching for a new, even more democratic way of running the organisation. First of all, I have to share with the board, like, in, during the days, I have to call the board and say, this is going to do, this is going to do. And when the meeting comes, I have to mention that things to all members. However, the most important goal, to build a house which would offer a real opportunity to become independent in terms of not needing outside support, was not achieved in the designated time. Up to now we are not able to do things ourselves. We need always Peace Institute to help us. Come down and sweep over my bed, sweet saying of the broken hearted. Come down and sweep over my bed, sweet saying of the broken hearted. So I might be still, I might be, might be, I might be still. I felt as if we failed. But what can be a real success in the frame of a development project, especially if one, as an old feminist, tries to avoid the logic of global non-governmental organization industries, pushing one's own agenda, sending and paying one's own staff, while traditional hierarchies in organizations are looming large in the field? Uh, I think, you know, the the understanding of Africa. <laughs> uh, for women, they would like to do something which is directly give the, the result. They have to understand that the result will come in many years, not directly now. They have to make that in the, to understand that. In 2011, the Nyamirambo Women's Centre continues with its work. Many local women are becoming literate and learn English. Volunteers and trainers are teaching them computer skills and visitors' guidance. The children join free holiday activities. Visitors are coming, although not too many of them. But they are all full of praise. They enjoy the tour and staying with Nyamirambo women. So, how are you satisfied with the tour? Sorry? Were you satisfied with the tour? Yes. Uh, it will depend on the period. There are some periods, like in April, we don't get visitors. But in July, August, they come often, like you can get like four groups per month. The members wish to continue and want to grow with the center. Will they succeed? What do they see when they think about the future? I wish the member of the center to grow up. En fait, les activités que le member of the center effectue pour le moment, je vois que ne donne pas aussi la rentabilité qu'il fallait. Uh, à cause uh, à cause de, de la disponibilité et juste des 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 de contribuables on peut programmer des activités hmm? si on fait par exemple des salons de coiffure hmm? qu'on engage quelqu'un et qui reçoit quelque chose de ce qu'il a fait Je crois que là, ils seront beaucoup plus intéressés et ils seront sérieux au boulot. Les people around, 
They wish themselves to be involved in Nyamran Women Center. So, I think in the future Nyamran Women Center will be a big, I don't know, I can't call it association. Mm -hmm. I can call it a company. It will be a very big company. Mm -hmm. And I wish to, and I wish myself to be there again. Nyamran Women Center, it's an NGO organization. We have to work for our community to empower women in general, not for the members only. What will prevail? Will solidarity prevail? Or something else? Yeah, I talk to them, I explain to them, I say, we come together, you never know. Something can happen. Just come together. If we have a problem, we discuss it. Because if I have a problem and I keep it to myself, I'll never be helped. Swimming